Okay, welcome back from break. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Nathan Seibert, from, uh, who's going to be talking about quantum field theory, separation of scale, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And Thank you for coming. Well, this is my pleasure. And I'd like to first congratulate the Buenos Boy for the Abel Prize for the birthday, don't say what year, <laughs> for a very, very long and spectacular career. I also want to thank you for our numerous conversations over the last several decades. And you will see in this talk that I will touch on some of the points that we've been talking about over the decades, although perhaps not from the perspective that we talked about. We talked about the relation between a short distance theory and a long distance theory, and how the long distance theory can be, can be described by an effective description of the short distance theory. I'll give a number of examples of how this works in all sorts of branches of science, but the main point of the talk is that this is not always true. So that's why I had them beyond the, the title. The second thing we talked about over the years was that instead of thinking of a manifold, we have some triangulation of a manifold and we place a theory on that triangulation. And for physicists, if the triangulation is smooth enough, it's clear that it doesn't matter whether we, it's, the manifold is, is smooth or not, the theory is the same theory. And again, I'll show examples where this is not the case. So that's kind of what we'll be talking about. But since we have a diverse audience here, I have a huge challenge, because it's not only diverse, I don't even know what people know or do not know. So I'm going to start very low with a broad brush description of physics and how various things fit together, and then I'll gradually speed up uh, to more modern things. The idea is that every person in the audience will have at least one minute that is good. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's two minutes, I feel that this, I've done a fantastic job. So let's start with a two by two dis description, a two by two table of physics. It's clearly a broad brush, it's not accurate, but I think it gives us some feel of where we are. So we start very early with Newton and Lagrange with classical mechanics, which describes the time evolution of a finite number. Who? Lagrange? Who? Lagrange. Yeah, Lagrange. Lagrange. Oh, yeah. Lagrange and Newton. This, this, this is Newton and this is Lagrange. And they were great physicists slash mathematicians slash philosophers, and they studied classical mechanics, which describes the time evolution of a finite number of particles, finite number of degrees of freedom, and there's a natural mathematical language for it, which is just solving ordinary differential equations. So we more or less understand that. Then we move to the 19th century, and instead of having a finite number of degrees of freedom, we have a continuum, or an infinite number of degrees of freedom, and here the title is classical field theory because the field is a continuous field and it evolves in time. Examples are the electromagnetic field, the velocity of the fluid, and various people contributed to it. We have now Stokes equations, Maxwell's equations, Einstein equations. And again, there's a natural mathematical setup for it, which is PDEs. There are still very interesting questions to be addressed in PDEs, but more or less we know, write the differential equations, we can put it in the computer, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's more or less understood. We're moving to the 20th century. Wait a second on the third one, because I think the other Maxwell. Maxwell, that is not That's Maxwell and Einstein, and I did not put pictures of Navi and Stokes, although I did find them, because they didn't fit on the slide. <laughs> Quantum mechanics. So here there are many more people who participated. This is the beginning of the 20th century. So it's the quantum mechanics of a finite number of degrees of freedom, like atoms with some finite number of electrons moving around. And again, there is a natural mathematical language, operators acting in a Hilbert space. Why doesn't this work? Operators acting in a Hilbert space. And perhaps here it is. I know where I'm going. <laughs> I pressed the wrong. I pressed the wrong button. Here. I didn't have enough coffee this morning. So that might not be completely rigorous, but we more or less know what's going on here. 
and lots of people contributed. This is still an interesting field. And this is finite number of degrees of freedom, which is the parallel of classical mechanics of Newton, finite number of degrees of freedom. And here we come to quantum field theory. So it's a two by two block. The previous slide was classical. This slide is quantum mechanical. And here we have time evolution of a continuum of an infinite number of quantum degrees of freedom, for example, the electromagnetic field. But unlike the previous three entries in the two by two table, here a lot is known, but still a lot still need to be done. So this is a very active field of research, and it's not mathematically mature. Some people claim it's not rigorous, and I really sympathize with this view. And we don't need rigor for the sake of rigor. We want rigor because that will advance us further. We want concepts. Yeah. As the famous mathematicians told me, you have lots of theorems, but no definitions. <laughs> <laughs> well, no concept. OK, so I view that as a, as a challenge or in, as an opportunity. It's not criticism, it's an opportunity. There's clearly something very interesting going on. There's something going on that's yeah. not conceptualized. Okay. Right. Like so I, I'm with you, and mm -hmm. I'm going to show the theme of this talk would be that things are even less conceptualized than most physicists think. Mm -hmm. So, I, wow. you're coming to us. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. <laughs> so, just to make the point that there's something going on here, quantum field theory is everywhere. It appears everywhere in physics. So let me just give you a summary of where it appears in physics. The same thing that is not conceptualized appears in particle physics. It describes the standard model of particle physics. And there are many things that can be computed, even though it's not conceptualized. This is not a typical example, but it is an interesting example. It's the electromagnetic dipole moment. Theoretically, the number is this. Experimentally, is this. This is the state of the art. And if you ask, do we know what we're doing? Yes, I think we know what we're doing. No other branch of science comes even close to such agreement with theory and experiment. The experiment, there were a number of Nobel Prizes for a number of the digits here. A number of the digits came, led to, but every one of them probes our understanding of quantum field theory deeper and deeper. And as we go deeper and deeper, we get more and more digits. On the experimental side, this is the bottom line, it's also a real tour de force especially as we progress with the digits. And there are two lessons here. One is that we really know what we're doing. I think that's quite clear from this picture. But also, the experimentalists are ahead of us, so we, the theorists, <laughs> we have some work <laughs> matching up. And we are not doing it just to show off. We're not doing it just to show off. We really hope that there is a discrepancy at some point. Because if there is a discrepancy, it means that there is something we are not understanding, and which will be a very sharp way of thinking about it. So that's particle physics. In condensed matter physics, the same mathematical structure, the same ill-defined mathematical structure, gives us the, long, the description of long-distance behavior of materials. What kind of phases? It could be a magnet, it could be superfluid, it could be semiconductor, or whatever. And there are phase transitions between them, which are also controlled by quantum field theory. It's kind of surprising that the same mathematical language controls different phenomena at totally different length scales for totally different reasons. It also appears in cosmology, describing the early universe and inflation. And it appears in string theory and quantum gravity. There are several different applications, to, several different places quantum field theory appears. And it has applications in mathematics. So it's clear that something very interesting is going on here, and we would like to understand it better. One principle that is active in quantum field theory is the idea of separation of scales, which appeared already in the title of my talk. So that actually appears in most sciences, and it's been going on for centuries, that we have effective descriptions at different length scales. And I'll give you some examples soon, but one aspect of it is that we can focus on physics or phenomena at one length scale, ignoring what happens at much shorter distances or at much longer distances, and we have a somewhat complete picture of what's going on there, and we call it an effective description. Uh, that, this leads to a simplification. We don't need to understand everything simultaneously. We don't need to understand all the details at short distances and all the, dis all the details at long distances. We don't need to understand simultaneously the structure of the atom 
and the structure of the universe in order to explain how a body moves on an inclined plane. Right? We think things become simple if we just focus on one scale. And in philosophy, this is known as the principle of reductionism. It's been, it's been dominating science through the ages. And here are some examples. In thermodynamics, we describe what happens when there is heat and so forth. And concepts like entropy existed long before people said that the entropy is the logarithm of the number of states. People talked about entropy before that. And that was, again, an effective description. We don't need to know that there are states and all the details in order to derive interesting results. Same is true for hydrodynamics. We have, I mentioned earlier, the Navier-Stokes equation. There is a PDE, which describes the motion of fluids. And in, in reality, the fluid, there's no fluid there. If you look at short distances, there are molecules, and the molecules bounce around. And the complete description involves all the molecules, but we have an effective description, this PDE, that describes the motion of the fluid. Recently, some of us became interested in epidemiology for obvious reasons. And again, there is a virus at short distances, and it has some RNA, and some people study the RNA and how it evolves, etc. Other people talk about public policy in keeping social distances. Social distancing. Uh, how many people can be in a room, ventilation. And there are also some global things like restricting, restricting flights between different nations. Now, if you want to study restrictions on people, say the distance between people and wearing masks and so forth, you don't need to know anything about the RNA. The problems work scale by scale. There is no mixing between the different scales. And that's a very effective and useful way of thinking about it. <coughs> Now, in the context of quantum field theory, this is not just a philosophical idea. This is not just a simplification. This is actually a calculation of tool advanced by Wilson and Weinberg. This is Ken Wilson, and this is Steve Weinberg, who passed away, unfortunately, recently. And that comes under the title of the renormalization. So we have different theories acting at different length scales, at short distances and at long distances. And to simplify a little bit, we talk about the UV. The UV is short distances, and the IR is long distances. IR is for infrared, UV is for ultraviolet, and I try to match the colors. Of course, I couldn't put that in ultraviolet and that in, in <laughs> infrared, because then you wouldn't see it. <laughs> so at short distances, we formulate a problem. At long distances, we find the answer. So for example, here we put some atoms in a box and we shake it, and we heat it, and we mix it, and so forth. And here we find the answer, what it does at long distances. At long distances, it's a magnet. Or at long distances, it's an insulator. And we would like to understand what are the possibilities at long distances. What can happen if we take this material and we look at it at long distances? What can it do? So there are all sorts of options. All of them are being described by quantum field theory. And the nice thing is that the effective description, the long distance behavior is much simpler than the short distance behavior because most of the details of the short distance theory are completely gone. You have the example of hydrodynamics. There are lots of details about where the molecules move, where every single molecule moves to the function of time, but that's totally uninteresting and not important. Much more important is how the fluid moves at long distances. So in that sense, we say that this is an effective description it's an effective description, it's efficient, and it simplifies life for us. It's also independent of most of the details, and that is the technical term, universality. One example is that the short distance theory could be on a lattice, and at long distances, we don't care that there's a lattice, like this table it has some structure at short distances of atoms, maybe they are arranged in a periodic thing, but we look at it here, well, that's not quite smooth enough, but it should be smooth <laughs> enough. And it's like approximating a sum by an integral. I'll say more about that soon. So when we come to quantum field theory, the very general thing is we can classify what kind of behavior can we see. And I'm not giving all the details, and there's a lot of fine print. But if I ignore the fine print, the phases of quantum field theories fall into two categories, and every one of them is subdivided. So we have a system in finite volume, and it has a Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian has a spectrum. And in the simplest cases, there is a ground state, maybe a finite number of them, then there is a gap, and then there is a continuum in the spectrum. 
That's a typical picture of the Hamiltonian, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And depending on the property, if we look at it at low distances, or we're looking at only at low energies, we only focus on these states. And if we take the volume to infinity, we focus on these states, and what we typically get is a topological field theory. And the second possibility is that there's no gap, and that's called gapless. The angle spectrum of the Hamiltonian has no gap, it's, it's like this. So an example of that would be if you have particles with a mass, you just take, put electrons in a box, it looks like this. If you put photons in a box, it looks like this. And it could be more complicated, and that's the topic of conformal field theory describes this thing. And then there's a more refined classification depending on more details. Now, continuum quantum field theory gives us a nice description of these phases. If we look at it, at so at short distances, we can have a lattice or some complicated behavior, and we see that there's only a finite number of particles, and they bounce around, and so forth. At long distances, we have a smooth material, and it's captured by quantum field theory. And the phases are interesting because we have a two-way street here. We can study these phases of materials, and this will teach us something about what quantum field theory could do. And conversely, studying quantum field theory can tell us what kind of phases can exist in nature. And here are some examples. You can have conformal field theories, topological field theories, a subset of them is invertible field theories. And there's huge interest by mathematicians in every one of these classes, and way above my knowledge and pay grade. And the more interesting thing that I would like to stress here again is that there's an interesting flow, and the word is flow, from what happens at short distances to what happens at long distances. This is the question, this is the answer. Quantum field theory, continuum quantum field theory lives here. And at short distances, we can have a lattice, or we can have some theory of quantum gravity, we can have all sorts of things, and the question is what happens here. Would you ask the question? Sure. So you started this by agreeing with Dennis that there were some missing concepts. Do you think those are in the arrow alone, or in, the, in both pieces, or? Everything. Well, a priori, everything should be questioned. <laughs> but I'm going to... Like, is it, is the U, do you think of the UV and the IR as kind of more understood and the arrow is the question? Or is no, that, that was my view until a few years ago. And now I'm questioning everything. <laughs> I, I make, I'll say very clearly why I'm questioning everything. I, I'm not I'm even questioning the separation between UV and I. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say that more, more clearly. So when we talked with Dennis the first time, some, I don't want to say how many years ago, except that was the picture. That was the picture. We flow from one to the other. Let me say one more thing about it. But then I'm going to talk soon about why this picture should be questioned. So the question whether it was a UV, there was an IR, we're talking about, say, four-dimensional n equals two, the SU2 is in the UV, the U1 theory, the abelian theory is in the IR. This is an example of a map from what happens at short distances to what happens at long distances. And it fits this general picture that has been dominating physics for more than a century. This picture is more than a century. Just refer to what we call the cyber theory. For example, yeah. <laughs> So here is an example, we have a lattice, we have a lattice, and we place degrees of freedom on the lattice, so we put them on the uh, sides or links, I think mathematicians call them vertices and edges of the lattice, so we put some degrees of freedom, we postulate some short range interaction, so degrees of freedom at one side interact only with the nearest neighbors or maybe next to nearest neighbors, but not too far, and that's the kind of problem that we have. And typically, the low energy theory is described by continuum quantum field theory. The lattice is gone, and it's captured by some continuum quantum field theory. And this is really a two-way street, as I said before. For our friends, the condensed matter physicists, the lattice is real. This is not a mathematical thing. This is really a lattice, and there are some atoms there that interact with each other. Because they see these little uh, anions arranged. Okay, anions is more sophisticated. They have atoms. Atoms. They have a, a lattice of atoms, like you take a salt, and it's made out of two kinds of ions, and there is a lattice, and if you take some other material, most materials, the atoms are in the lattice, and then the lattice 
the atoms interact with each other, and there's some electrons, and there's a whole story. But the lattice is real. There is a real lattice, and at long distances, it's being described by some continuum quantum field theory. In high energy physics, the picture is backwards. We are interested in continuum quantum field theory, and we use the lattice as a way of defining it. So when there's a question of how we're we going to define it, it has all these infinities. So, okay, let's discretize it. Now we have a finite number of degrees of freedom. Now it's ordinary quantum mechanics. Everything is well defined. And the challenge is to prove that the limit exists. So we go both ways. In condensed matter physics, the lattice is real. And the goal is to find the continuum description. Why is that a goal? I've always wondered why that's a goal. By whom? For condensed matter physics? Yeah, no, why is it the goal to try to get a limit, which is the continuum theory? For, 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 this, for, yeah, okay. So for condensed matter people, the goal is to figure out what the material does. You put the, some atoms in a box, and you, the atoms arrange themselves in a, in a lattice, and there are some spins, and they interact with each other, and they would like to know in the end of the day, is this a magnet or not? Does it con con uh, conduct electricity or not? And then I hit the system, and it undergoes a phase transition to something else. What happens near the phase transition? But that's what they would like to determine. And the magnet is like a continuum. That's correct. Okay. And at long distances, everything looks smooth and continuous. So that's in one direction. For high energy physicists, it's the opposite. The continuum, we would like to define the continuum. And we use the lattice as a way to define the continuum. So we discretize it, like we have an integral. How do we define the integral? We break it into little pieces, and we have a sum. And then we have to prove that the limit exists. And I, for one, thought. In particular, you expect that the limit has more symmetries than the lattice. Right? It, so it, we, we expect yeah. that. <laughs> One of the weird things is the lattice is not something that kind of breaks the That's right. So that one, there, it's not just more symmetries. There are many more properties in the continuum, but it depends on fewer parameters. The lattice model depends on lots of parameters. I can add another English, next to next to nearest, so whatever. And, but that won't change a lot the long distance behavior. And there's a very quantitative way of saying it, classifying operators, whether they are relevant or irrelevant. And there's a finite number of parameters in the continuum theory. So the high energy physicists would like to use it either to define it or to do numerical calculation. When people want to do numerical calculation, we need to discretize it. They discretize it, they put it on the computer, and they find the answers. So, so you know that you have to have a priori what the, the continuum is going to be. Because so if, if you start, if you're a condensed matter physicist, that's what you would like to know. Uh -huh. If you're a high energy physicist, you know what you would like to get. And the question is, what should I write right on the lattice such okay. that I get this? So you thing? have property of the continuous, and then you want to build the lattice in a way that will reproduce the That's correct. Okay. That's correct. But as I said, this is a two-way street. Yeah. Some people work in this direction, some that, and they change their mind. It's, it's, it's a very, literally, tens of thousands of physicists work on this for one aspect or, or another. This is a huge activity. So that's the end of the good news. <laughs> so this was all based on this separation of scales. We have a lattice theory. We have a continuum theory. We have a short distance theory. We have a long distance theory. We have a UV theory. We have an IR theory. We use various adjectives. But there are various reasons to think that this might not be the case. Might not, be, might not always be the case. So the first. Example, so we call it UVIR mixing. So what happens at short distances and what happens at long distances, they do not decouple. And there's sensitivity at long distances to what happens at short distances. And there are such phenomena. First of all, it's common in gravity. In gravity, if you try to ask what happens at short distances, historically in physics, when you ask, want to ask what happens at short distances, you need a bigger magnifying glass. And a big magnifying glass involves throwing particles at each other at larger and larger energy and let them hit each other closer and closer. When you have gravity around, when you localize too much energy in a small region, you create a black hole. And the more energy you put in, the bigger is the black hole, thus hiding what happens at short distances. So this is a general property of gravity. That if you try to ask what happens at short distances, the theory hides it from you. 
the black hole gets bigger as you put more energy in. This is the first sign. Historically, this was the first example where short distances and long distances are mixed together. Then there are some examples in dualities with small distances and long distances. So well, you also don't have gravity as part of QFT. That's also, so you, if that, I'm going to say that soon. So many questions about gravity, conceptual questions about gravity, circle around this thing that distance is an emergent concept, and therefore you shouldn't really be talking about short distances and long distances. And there are all sorts of questions that I'm not going to get into a long list of them. Then gravity does not fit this picture of UV and IR that are separated. And then Dennis said correctly, well, that's not quantum field theory. Maybe that we should just ignore this example. Well, first of all, we shouldn't because it exists in nature. But I claim that that's, it's true that it doesn't happen in, in gravity, but it also, and that's the next bullet, it also happens without gravity. So here is an example where it's very clear, this was the first place we saw that, we as a community, that we have such mixing, it occurs in gravity. But we can also take string theory as a machine to produce theories. And it has been a very big activity over the last several decades to take string theory and to consider various limits when we make Newton constant arbitrarily small. So we turn off Newton constant in various string backgrounds. And as we do that, <coughs> if Newton constant is zero, there is no gravity. There is no gravitational force because Newton constant is zero. But so what we typically get is some quantum field theory. So let's see what we get. So this has been a huge activity. Many people took limits in various cases. And in most cases, we learned about, we found some quantum field theory. In fact, that was a useful tool that allowed us to solve some quantum field theory. So it's not just a philosophical thing. It actually produces formulas, formulas that are very nice even for mathematicians. But in some cases, the limit does not give us a quantum field theory. I'll just give the names here. I'm not going to discuss in detail. There's something called the little string theory. Also, if you put field, quantum field theory on a non-commutative space, also the result does not satisfy this separation of scales. So, so if you put you zero gravity Zero gravity limit. So we started in string theory, but now we just remove gravity. We decouple gravity. So if we think of a two-dimensional plane, and say it's a non-commutative space, so x and y don't commute, the two coordinates do not commute, and you put field theory of that space, we no longer have separation of scales in that case. So that's a warning sign that maybe it's not always true that we have this separation of scales. And finally, what I really want to talk about is that so somebody could say, okay, we Previous slide, I had gravity. Says, okay, that's not quantum field theory. It doesn't have to, to work. That was Dennis's point. And then I said, well, even here, oops, I'm going backwards. Here we got some examples, but maybe we got these examples from string theory. It's not traditional field theory. So maybe this is not yet, it's just a warning sign that maybe, maybe we shouldn't take it too seriously. But over the last several years, it's so now maybe a decade or so, there were some lattice models that people found, mostly accidentally, and they do not fit this picture. So these are very concrete lattice models. We start from a lattice with degrees of freedom on the sides and the edges, etc. With local interactions, everything looks very conventional, and it does not fit this picture of separation of scales. So if when we talked about that decades ago, and I said, oh, of course, it's always going to work, and you, you were skeptical, you were completely right. There are examples where this is not the case, and I'm going to show them. So there are exotic models of various kinds. We'll review them. I gave a list of them, something called Lipschitz theory, xy plaquette model, fractal models, some references, and many others. And the common thing to all of them is they do not have a standard continuum limit. So these are good lattice models that the limit does not exist, and the limit is actually, some of them is crazy, and in others it's even more crazy. So the challenge is related to their peculiar properties. First of all, they have unusual global symmetries. They are symmetries that depend on position. So the symmetry transformation that acts at one value of the position, and the independent one that acts at a separate value of the position. Sorry? It's not homogeneous. On the lattice, nothing is homogeneous. 
No, but in terms that you move around the lattice, the symmetry is going to change. The, the translation acts on the symmetry. Okay. The symmetry group is la labeled by, it's, it's roughly it's a product of uh -huh. the different points. So in that sense, it's homogeneous. It's actually, there's a quotient of that that you need to take, but roughly speaking, it's, it's still all. There's still translation symmetry, but the translation symmetry acts on the global symmetry position. Then there are excitations with restricted mobility. So there are particles in the spectrum, and the particles are such that they cannot move at all. No matter how much energy you give them, they cannot move. They can split to three particles, but they cannot move. So that, or they can move on the line, but not, cannot move on the orthogonal line. So this is a restricted mobility. <coughs> Can't you use that to make a quantum computer? That actually was one of the reasons people were interested in that. Mm -hmm. People were interested in that, not only for that, but especially for this reason, that they have a huge ground state degeneracy. <coughs> so we talked before about the ground state and that there might or might not be a gap. The, the, number, the number of ground states is typically 2 to a power that depends on the number of sites in the lattice, Nx, Ly, and Lz. So imagine we have a three-dimensional lattice with periodic boundary conditions. And we had such a number. Whoops. So this is the total number of ground states. And it depends on Lx, Ly, and Lz. That is, we try to take any of them to infinity the limit either does not exist or diverges. So before we ask, is there a continuum limit or not, let's compute something. So these, most of these models are completely solvable. These are lattice models that are completely solvable. You diagonalize the Hamiltonian. You know the spectrum. This is the result. And the result does not have a limit, regardless of whether it's being captured by continuum field theory. Yeah. What's k there? Some function. I assume give examples. Some function of the the three legs. So we formulate a system, so we have for in different systems, k is a different function. It's two to a function that depends on the size. I'll soon give examples. And they have UVIR mixing. Long distance phenomena, like for example, the number of ground states, depends sensitively on the number of sites. So you, add, you will make the lattice a little bit finer, and the number of ground state grows by a lot. When you talked about quantum computers, people were interested in that primarily at the beginning to make quantum memory because we have lots of ground states and the system is robust. And you can't kick it with local operators and move it from one to the other. Right? That's what you need for, for a quantum computer. So this was one of the motivations. And in fact, this thing has a very long history, depending on how you describe it. Some of, it, some of the major steps happened by happened by people in computer science and quantum information. Um, At the beginning, some of these people did not even realize that this is a very interesting phase of matter. Because they found all the peculiarities, but their motivation was completely different. And these lists of these models lead to a whole set of questions. So I mentioned some peculiarities like particles with restricted mobility, large ground state degeneracy, and so forth. But not all examples have all of them. And these examples were found at random. And people did something and then stumbled on an example, and then somebody else did something else and stumbled on another example. And there isn't a sensible classification. The current classification is type one, type two, and the rest, more or less. I'm exaggerating, but that's what it is. So how should we think of such theories? They do not fit the general picture. The general picture of a lattice model at short distances, a continuum field theory at long distances, this thing clearly does not fit. How should we organize them, classify them? But again, we are not botanist. We don't want to classify for the sake of having a classification. We think that the classification will give us some structure, will explain to us why these things exist. Are there other examples? What kind of pattern can we expect here? And in particular, there is all the quantum field theory description. So in the next few slides, I'll be a little bit more technical and I'll present examples. And the main point of the examples is not that I can convey all the details of the examples, but just to show you that these are very concrete systems. That's the point. So one of them, which was not actually the first one, is known as the X cube model. So we have Z2 spins, so we have a lattice in three dimensions. We have a Z2 spin, this is a qubit uh, on every spatial link. So on every link of the lattice, we put a two-dimensional Hilbert space. 
and the full Hilbert space is the product of them. And you an edge? Ed, yeah, link is an edge. In physics, link is an edge, and site is a vertex. I never understood why it's called an edge. It's not the edge of anything. It's the edge of the face. The okay, so the face is. Okay, so as we continue the dictionary, the faces are called plaquettes in physics. <coughs> so faces are plaquettes, the edges are links, and vertices are sites. Ah. So it's all, there's at least a one to one map between the two languages. <laughs> <laughs> That's not always the case. So we're on a Hamiltonian. So it's a very well defined system. We have a two dimensional Hilbert space on every link, on every edge. And we write a Hamiltonian that multiplies the operator sigma 1. This is a 2 by 2 matrix, which is 0, 1, 1, 0. We multiply that on the, all the edges around the cube. So that's, this is an operator that acts only on a finite number of edges. So that's B. And we add, we add this thing over the whole lattice. So we sum over whole cubes. And then we have other interactions. We take sigma 3. This is 1, 0, 0, minus 1 on the four links. We we'll multiply them here. These are four of them. And we take this thing and we add them for all possible orientation. There are three orientations. And then we sum over the sides. So that might not be the first interaction you would write down. But it's not completely crazy. Its nearest neighbors, the Hamiltonian is a sum of a finite number of terms. Every term talks only to, to a finite number of them which are near each other. This system is actually completely solvable. It's, you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian completely. Even without a computer, you can diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And so you know the full spectrum. And it's innocent looking. But now we can ask ourselves, Imagine we have a lattice with Lx times Ly times Lz sites, namely vertices, with periodic boundary conditions. So now everything was spelled out. And now this is the function. So you ask me what's k. In this case, k is this thing. It's 2 times Lx plus Ly plus Lz minus 3. So that's the final answer. And that by itself is crazy. So the logarithm of the number of ground states is the entropy of the system. And the entropy could be proportional to the volume of the system. That's very typical. Entropy is proportional to the volume, and the technical term is extensive. We say the entropy is extensive. The alternative is that there's one ground state or a finite number of ground states, and then we say the entropy is zero. This is in between. It's sub-extensive. But notice that if we make the lattice finer and finer, and we make these integers bigger and bigger, we get more and more ground states. So we add one more layer of sites to our uh, lattice, we add one more layer, the answer of the number of ground states is multiplied by four. And if we add another one in the other direction, it's still multiplied by four. And if we think of a lattice which has, which is some kind of a macroscopic material that has L is say 10 to the 10th, you get an astronomical number of ground states. And yeah, this is very disturbing. Are the, are the, are the ground states, states structured in some way, or do they, they look kind of random? Or? Well, in this case, they're structured in the sense that there is a symmetry group that acts on them. And they're all in one representation of a huge symmetry group. In that sense, they're structured. This will not be the case in the next example. Yes? Okay, so the ground state reflects short distance physics. Even the number of ground states reflect short distance physics. Even the symmetry group of the system reflects short distance details. This is unlike what I said earlier, that we have some lattice at short distances, who cares about the details? We have something in the continuum with long distances. That's not the case here. So this system has a gap. It is gap in the spectrum. Before I talked about gap and not gap. So small deformations of the Hamiltonians do not change the low energy theory. And as I said earlier, there are some excitations with restricted mobility. If anybody's interested, I can post the slides and then you don't need to. <laughs> so there are particles with, so this is one example. 
But there's another example that was found earlier by Hart, who was also a co-author of this. And it's no, it comes under the name of Haas Code. And uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. It's a Korean name. Uh -huh. And well, he said the same, something similar. We had two qubits at every site. So at every site of our lattice, we put two qubits, so there's a four-dimensional Hilbert space at every site. And there are two terms in the Hamiltonian that act on this four-dimensional space. Uh, so we multiply some operators on this side with some operator in here, here, and here. We go all the way around. And this is another one. And the, you're not, don't try to follow the details. This system exists. It again looks very innocent. And it's local interaction. And again, it is solvable. It's solvable using some math that goes beyond me, but there are explicit formulas that you can write down. And what he found is, first of all, there are excitations with restricted mobility again. But this is perhaps the most surprising thing, that the ground state degeneracy is a completely crazy function. So you asked me for what's k. Here, I don't know whether there is a closed form expression for k. k is given as the number of solutions of some equation but that's almost a closed form expression. But it's a complicated number theoretic function of Lx, Ly, and Lz. It's even complicated if you write, if you set them all equal. It's not monotonic in L. It's bounded by L. So we get something that grows exponentially in L, but as you make Lx or Ly or Lz bigger by one, it can drop to be a number of order one. Bounded from above? Bounded from above. It, it, you add one more layer and it can drop to be one state. Uh, you add another layer, it's two to the L. You add another layer, it's some, somewhere in between. So it's not just that it's infinite, it's L defined. Depending on which sequence of L you take L to infinity, the answer you get is completely different. So that's even more disturbing because it means that the limit, if we make the lattice finer and finer, there's no limit. So forget whether you can describe it with quantum field theory or not, whether you can describe it with smooth fields or not. There's no limit. The final answer doesn't have a limit. That's the answer. There is no structure on the limit space on if L is even or... So in simple cases there is, and here there isn't. In simple cases there uh, Yeah, so it's, it, there's some certain uh, equation that needs to be solved, and in, in this case the number of the solution of the equations. <coughs> Is there some rescaling so the effects, even though they don't converge, they stay bounded? They, no, because it's e to the it's two to the n. No, there's some rescaling. No, there's no rescaling. So people try various things to. Yeah, the, the fact that it doesn't fit this picture of taking the limit is very much for the limit. I just wanted to keep varying but boundedly by some re, re normalizing. They, they, no, because it's, they, it's an erratic function. I don't have a picture here. We have it. We worked it out with Mathematica in the, in the cousin of this model, and it's a completely erratic function. What is function erratic? Are the functions correspond? No, the number of the number of ground states. Ah, k is a function of l. Yeah, k is a function of l is an erratic function, bounded by l, but it's a yeah. Yeah, it doesn't fit like it does not look like anything. The, so the limit is ambiguous. And then there's another class of models, which appear like generalizations of gauge theories. In gauge theories, we, this is the gauge transformation, so this is the time derivative, because we the time derivative of alpha. And instead of having a vector here, we put a tensor, symmetric tensor. This is what Mr. Shu suggested, for totally different reasons. And then they're gauge invariant electric and magnetic fields, and you can write a Lagrangian, which is e squared minus b squared. The main point is that we have two derivatives here. So that's unlike what we normally do. And then Pretko noticed that if we do electrodynamics with such a, not a vector potential, but a tensor potential, so it's a symmetric tensor, then Gauss law is this function, and we have both conserved charge and conserved dipole charge. And if we have conserved dipole charge, then particles cannot move. But if we have a particle with a charge, 
The dipole is the charge times the position. And if you try to move it to another place, the dipole will be different. So we get restricted mobility. So all this raises lots of questions. First of all, are there more examples with perhaps more exotic phenomena? These examples were found completely at random. And what's the underlying reason for the bizarre behavior? And is there some organization in these examples? I presented three, but there are many others. Well, they all have frustration, right? Sorry? They all have frustration. Yeah. Have so many ground states because yeah. you don't let them move, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. But the frustration is very crazy. It's not like standard systems with frustration. Yeah. When you write down one of these theories, is there some constraint that has to happen so that it's something you're worth discussing? Yeah, and, and this is an interesting question. So uh, let me rephrase it and tell me whether this is. Given a system, can I tell that it would exhibit this crazy behavior short of solving it? The answer is no. So I, you change a little bit, you change, this, you take this Hamilton and say, oh, I don't want to multiply these two corners, I multiply two other corners. The behavior is completely different. So the typical model, if you, so you have a computer that spits examples, the typical example will not exhibit this behavior. But this behavior is still there. So um, they are very visionary, those behavior. Sorry? You put this model and you change the way that you multiply it, so they are not going to be as crazy as those. <coughs> That's correct. That's correct. So they are very however, visionary, those examples. Yeah, however, this behavior is generic in the sense that any small deformation of this Hamiltonian <coughs> does not ruin it. Does not ruin this crazy behavior. In other words, if you look at the space of all possible Hamiltonians, this is not measure zero. It's not measure zero in this. It's a small set, but it's not measure zero. Because for any one of them, I wrote a particular one. But you can add now any random deformation as long as the coefficient is small enough, the crazy behavior stays. What are the physical phenomena that describe all those models? So, as I said, Loud ground state degeneracy and particles with restricted mobility. And no L going to infinity limit. And so, is it correct to say what you're looking for is like, you like nice Hamiltonians and then you want some extra criteria so that there's a well defined limit in some sense? Is that? I don't have any prejudice. I would like to understand what's going on here. If they, no this, what having such, having, answering, Finding the criterion whether this thing happens or not, a priori, short of solving the system, would be a step forward. Yeah, but these, you call these wild examples, but no matter what set of criteria you decided on, you would expect there to be non-examples. I'm surprised that any of these examples exist. <laughs> I, if you ask, I, it's not just if you ask me, the first time I heard about these things, I remember I was at a conference and somebody told me, and I said, okay, it's obviously wrong. There's no reason I should pay attention. Somebody will debug it, and then I will not have to go. Because there was, there was no way this thing is right. If this thing goes against the spirit of the renormalization group, it goes against the spirit of the way one field theory works. It goes against the spirit of separation of scales that I emphasized. This thing goes against everything that is totally hardwired into me. And so I, getting any understanding of this, I think, would be very interesting. And I think it re it kind of underscores the skepticism that I had with the Dennis expressed early on when we talked about quantum field theory. How do you know that the limit exists? Maybe the limit doesn't exist. I remember him asking, I said, oh yeah, of course it always exists. He was right. The limit doesn't always exist. Excuse me. So in your models, uh, you're always thinking of short range interaction, yeah? Yeah. I mean, there are also models like uh, Freeman Dyson made this uh, kind of hierarchical model where you have, uh, you know, long range. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, these models and with long range. So, okay, let me first correct. These are not my models. So far, I have not. I don't have ownership of any of them. I did not publish them. I reviewed them. I'm, I'm going to get to things that I've done, but this is just kind of what's out there. Now, in the spirit of the renormalization group and field theory and all that. You have to assume that the interaction is short range, uh -huh. short distances. If you allow long range interaction, all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. So let's limit ourselves to short range interactions. Mm -hmm. Even if you assume that, these examples still exist. If you allow long range interactions, there's no notion of locality and so forth. Mm -hmm. you know, 
you move something here, it instantaneously affects things very far. Sorry, you mentioned the renormalization group picture when we go from energy scales to you know, relate them. What's the relationship between that and the size of the labs? That so in, in a relativistic system, it's very clear. Long distances, uh, low energies go together. What happens here is that it's non-relativistic, so energy and momentum are not the same. And the main point here is that we have lots of low energy states with high momentum. So people try to write various continuum Lagrangian for this. So you just follow your nose and you write, you just follow your nose and you write something, and let's see what happens. And here are some typical examples that people wrote down. You can write a scalar field theory, so that's in the continuum. We, and the key point here is that we have four derivatives. We, we have two time derivatives, but we have four spatial derivatives. So that looks like a nice uh, standard field theory which we can solve. And we can have a different way of summing the indices here that people wrote down. And all these models were analyzed. I'll soon say a few words about them. I already mentioned these gauge theories with tensors, which also exhibits this behavior. And we can also write various Chern Simons theories for these fields and many others. In fact, the X cube model that I presented earlier appears very much like a Chern Simons theory for uh, this tensor gauge field. And the main point here is that the higher derivative terms in these continuum Lagrangians make a big difference. So these Lagrangians do not have a two spatial derivative term, but they have a four spatial derivative term. And now we're really going back from the two ends. We have a lattice model, which has crazy behavior, and we have continuum models, which could be kind of candidates to be the description. But it has actually degeneracy of the state. That's right. Well, that's, that's what we wanted. Right, that's what we wanted. So the question is, how should we think of such continuum theories which have this infinite degeneracy? So here is a continuum model that has this infinite degeneracy. And how is that connected to what, what appears on the labs? So this is our collaboration. Finally, we're coming to my work. It was early in the days of the pandemic. I didn't even know how to put a background at that point in time. <laughs> so we studied lots of questions. Uh, what do such Lagrangians mean? What continuum field theories with such higher derivatives? What do, what do they even mean? How should we think of them? Uh, for one thing, we need to study field configurations which are discontinuous. Normally, we write a Lagrangian which has, say, d by dx phi square. If phi varies too rapidly, then the action suppresses it has infinite action. So we don't need to think about discontinuous functions. Here, because of the double derivatives, we can have functions that are discontinuous in x and still have finite energy with finite action. For example, if the Lagrangian has d by dx, d by dy, phi, quantity square, we can take a discontinuous function of x independent of y, and that doesn't contribute to the energy. So that's an example of a function. And it actually reflects physics that exists there on the lattice. So we have to study field theory with discontinuous field configurations, which is, of course, opening a Pandora's box. Because once we have discontinuous field configurations, we stop multiplying them by taking derivatives. It's not clear how to work with this. And if we have gauge theories. What's the global structure? What does it mean to have fluxes, etc.? So in simple cases, we could give some rules rules that reproduce the lattice answers. And then, what's, more generally, what's the relation between these continuum theories and the lattice models? And we have many results about, many, about uh, various theories, about many theories. So, somebody mentioned earlier that typically the continuum theory has more symmetries than the lattice model. I forget who asked that thing. So, we could find new lattice models, which exhibit the same peculiar behavior, but they have more of the continuum symmetries already on the lattice. That was a good thing, because that, would, that allowed us to establish a more clear dictionary between the lattice and the continuum. We also found lots of new models, because we knew what we were looking for. So unlike a random search, for example, we found lots of new models. 
we exhibit new symmetries and are even closer to the continuum limit. Uh, sorry. And, uh, so you have your lattice, and then you say, well, we want to find a limit space. And you say your limit space will be some space that exceeds this continuity, and some Lagrangian acting on this space with this continuity. Yeah. And this continuity is what is the one that is going to describe this uh, crazy ground space. Yeah. Uh, we can't do better than that. It sounds crazy, but that's the best we can hope for. Okay. okay. Given that we have this lattice model and the naive limit has this behavior, the question was, can we capture that using a continuum theory? Maybe we can't. Maybe we shouldn't think of a continuum theory at all and just abandon this thing. But if we want to phrase that in the language of continuum field theory, we have no choice but doing what you just said. And in these expressions that I wrote down do the job. One thing we learn with these expressions, with these theories, that we can take two different limits of the lattice or the continuum. So one thing is the continuum limit. We take the lattice basic to zero and the number of sides to infinity with fixed length. So we have a lattice model. We try to make it finer and finer. We scale the parameters such that the distance between sides goes to zero and the number of sides goes to infinity, holding the length fixed. That usually leads to continuum field theory in finite volume. Right? The lattice is finer and finer, and the total volume is fixed. Another limit we could take is L going to infinity, the number of sides going to infinity, with fixed lattice space. That's usually called the thermodynamic limit. These two limits don't commute for these models. What you mean? Do not commute. First L to infinity and then L to zero. Yeah. Okay. These two limits don't commute. Which again, for me, is a shock because when you study lattice models and you take the continuum limit and the thermodynamic limit, they always commute. We also studied various other limits which lead to other answers. So these are some of our conclusions. Typically, the lattice models have more symmetries than the underlying lattice. The continuum theory has more symmetries, and the new lattice models that we wrote down have these symmetries, so they are closer to the continuum. And starting with the lattice, with the lattice, and we found various limits, and these two limits don't commute. And that's the hallmark where we wanted. So what we wanted is a theory both on the lattice and in the continuum that exhibits this UVIR mixing. So approaching the end of my talk, so we started with this whole thing about quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is everywhere. And it's clear that it's clear that there's something there, and it appears as the language of physics, as it appears in many distinct branches of physics for different reasons, different length scales, different phenomena. And the fundamental property of it is the issue of separation of scales. In fact, not, this is not only in quantum field theory, it's in all of science for centuries. There has been this separation of scales, and we said that that's a good thing, because without that, we would never be able to understand anything in science if we had to understand everything simultaneously. And it's called reductionism. And most of the details of the short distance theory do not affect the long distance theory. That's called universality. And then we showed some string constructions and some lattice models that lead to peculiar systems that break this uh, dogma. Some systems for which the UV and the IR mix together. And we cannot just focus on long distances, ignoring all the details of short distances. And then we presented some lattice models, or call them exotic models, and they exhibit UVIR mixing, which included large ground state degeneracy and observables change on the lattice scale. So the results are discontinuous if we try to take any limit because they, as you change, hop from side to side, the answers are completely different. And this seemed in incompatible with the framework of quantum field theory. And then we analyzed some non-standard continuum theories that would design such that they would exhibit such crazy behavior. And they captured the universal part of the story. The main message of this talk is that lots of puzzles remain. Uh, this is more of a it, this talk is not supposed to present summary of my understanding, but telling you that there's something very interesting going on here. 
And if you thought the quantum field theory is interesting before and challenging, this thing should tell you that it's much more, more interesting than we thought. So thank you. Here I can be more sophisticated. I can shift it by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. And it is still a global symmetry. And it leaves this Lagrangian invariant. Such a symmetry is known as subsystem symmetry. The zero mode is the same. So we have to make a quotient. But the zero mode, the constant mode here is the same as the constant mode here. But other than that, this is an infinite symmetry because you can shift phi by any function of x. It could even be discontinuous. And nothing stops you from this function to be discontinuous. And that's a global symmetry in the sense that it's independent of time. So you have operators that depend on the, the transformer under it. Correlation functions are constrained by it. Right? And that's known, this is an example of a subsystem symmetry. System. Let me give you a simpler example, which is known as Lifshitz theory. It's in one plus one dimension. Let me be in the Lorentzian signature. This is the Lagrangian. And I can shift phi goes to phi plus a constant plus a term linear in x. Now you can ask me now about boundary conditions. So let x be the same as x plus a, and phi be periodic. So phi is circle value. So we have a map from a circle, space of a circle, to a circle. And then this alpha, in this case, alpha should be n 2 pi, 2 pi n over n. And then it even satisfies the boundary conditions. So now it's not a continuum, but the symmetry is z. Right? We can shift phi by such a thing with any integer n. Right? n is an integer. So this is a system that has a symmetry that, right? and this thing, this Lagrangian was written decades ago by Mr. Lipschitz. It's not the Lipschitz of Landau Lipschitz. This is his brother. Oh. And so this is the Lagrangian. And if phi is circle value, then space is circle value, then you have this symmetry z. And if phi is not compact, then phi is not, both phi and the space are not compact, we can put any, any coefficients there. And that's a symmetry group. That's a global symmetry. The Hilbert space should be in a representation of that symmetry. So that's an example. In the in the, the theory that you wrote on the left here, are, you make x and y both periodic. Yeah, you can make. Them. I usually prefer to work in finite volume because in infinite volume there, there might be new subtleties, and I would also like make phi to phi periodic. So this looks like a question studying such classical Lagrangians would be done in the 19th century. Right? There's no, and it's straightforward. You diagonalize these, the elliptic operator. You diagonalize it. You know all the eigenvalues. Right? There's nothing 
fancy here, except that we have this crazy symmetry. And these are different symmetries here and here. That's called a, a subsystem symmetry that's known as a dipole symmetry. It's dipole because it's linear in X. So these these two examples capture a lot of the peculiarity that I mentioned. Now they are in the continuum. So these are continuum systems. They're rather singular because of these infinite groups. So these are sing very, very singular systems. But you know, we can write the logarithm and we can work out the consequences. And we can also analyze it on the lattice. On the lattice, all the infinities become finite because everything is finite on the lattice. And uh, yeah, now we can try and compare the lattice and the continuum. Uh, a lot of degeneracy of the ground state, if you take finite temperature, would it break this mixing between IR and the Yeah, that's an excellent question that I don't know the answer to. Can you but state, the, restate the question? The question is what happens if we take these systems at finite temperature? One reason I'm, I find it confusing is that the partition function is infinite in the continuum limit. So if I work at zero temperature and I have some some states and correlation function that I could just do, uh, even in the zero. But the partition function is infinite because there's an infinite number of ground states. So I don't know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. So you mean you can't think thermodynamically there? Mm -hmm. uh, Final temperature would remove some frustration in the sense of conflict. Let the couple IR from UV, that's what the idea is. Yeah. Make it shake and yeah, but, uh, but the, the temperature allows you to, forces you to explore all these states simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's I, I don't know giving you a good answer. Well, I'm telling you that I do not know the answer. That's, that's a definitive mm -hmm. statement. Yeah. So in this left-hand theory, if you, weren't, if you weren't on a torus, if you were trying to do, do it in Euclidean space, then it looks like you have a Lorentz group backing in X and Y. I don't know, but you can okay. No, it's just saying, if you try to make it in R3, X, Y, and T, you know, not periodically. Uh, yeah. So okay. there, you, it looks like you have a, a Lorentz group that's acting in X and Y, right? You could, you could uh, replace... It's not Lorentz. The, 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 the dispersion system. relation is not yet of the... Well, so I'm just looking at the operator. You know, no, there's no Lorentz because y. this is quadratic in X and Y, and this is linear in T. Right, no, so but there's no Lorentz group. Without... Just making X and Y. So then you can multiply X by e to the U and multiply uh, Y by e to the minus U. And then, oh, 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 and then this yeah. operator. So that's a that's a two-dimensional Lorentz group that also acts. You're not going to see it on the torus. You could yeah. interchange X and yeah. Y. But you you have yeah. So well, I think what you're saying is that there are various scale symmetries of this system, right. uh, which are peculiar to a two dimension, but not. If I bump it up in dimensions, it would not be true. But, so this system has something of, of, that is reminiscent of the conformal group that acts here. And as far as I can tell, well, we looked at that. I, it, I didn't find anything useful in that. But, see, th these models are misleadingly simple. Because you look at them and say, OK, it, it can't be too hard in both this and that. But it, they're actually quite subtle, especially if you start computing correlation functions, which is completely, right, these are Gaussian models, everything is quadratic, everything is solvable, right? The equation of motion is a linear PDE, what can be, what can be so hard here? And yet, because of all these symmetries, it's solved. But again, these models do not capture all the subtleties of the lattice model. These are kind of baby versions that demonstrate the, some of these others, right? And I brought it up because somebody, I think you asked me, uh, and I think these examples kind of demonstrate the answer to your question. Yeah. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the function k? Like, so if you're finding what integer solutions, there's some... So yeah, so I, this is way above me. Okay. Uh, I can give you a reference. But is, is it a system of equations? Yeah, but it's sometimes the equation in the field and so forth. This is translated to a finite math problem that you can put in the computer for any finite uh, for any finite a. You can put it in the computer and it spits a number. And then do you expect that there are other like for for, for most models you would encounter such a function? 
I'm not, I'm not making any blanket statement. Okay. I, I know I had, well, there may be 10 examples in the literature. We added a few more, okay. and every one of them is different. Uh, I don't see any pattern. My take on that is that the fact that I don't see any pattern, I think what it means is that there are many more examples that we haven't yet found. Because, it, yeah, because otherwise you would see the pattern and say, okay, that's what's going on. But every example looks completely different. And most of these examples arise, uh, every one of the examples came from totally different reasoning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can there are examples of what? Of lattice systems with short range interactions, with <coughs> exhibiting crazy ground state de de degeneracy with or without a, a particles with restricted mobility. Well, so why are we allowed to try to understand all lattice models? Well, I thought that's the name of the game. Write all, poss all possible lattice models and ask what can they do. And the hope was that the long distance behavior is captured by all possible field theories. So if we want to understand all possible continued field theories, we'll just scan all possible lattice models and we'll learn about all possible field theories. That one motivation. And these things don't fit into the general framework. I find that very interesting because I thought the quantum field theory describes everything. And we just need to find all of them. But they do not quite fit into the general. So we, so we don't have a definition of quantum field theory. Well, but that I think underscores this fact. What? So whatever the defi whatever definition you have, this one doesn't. <laughs> Which tells you either but this may not be able, may not include that definition. But it, they exist. These systems exist. So maybe we should change the definition. This non-existing. No, definition. we don't have a definition. Okay. So there are two options. One, one day we will have a definition, and these guys will be excluded right from the de that definition. Or when we try to find a definition, we should keep in mind that these examples exist and try to accommodate them. I can envision that there would be a big set of all quantum field theories if I, with some definition. And then the various adjectives that you add, and then they are more restricted. That this is very common. Like renormalizable. Sorry? Like renormalizable. I'm talking, yeah, like renormalizable, and there could be others. This is worse. This renormalizable means that the theory is complete and infrared. Otherwise, uh, it's not, it, it's, it, it becomes meaningful at long distances. But these things, these things are crazy already at long distances. So what? These are crazy already at long distances. Yeah. So they're not renormalizable. Well, this is free. This is renormalizable. These two examples are perfectly renormalizable. They're free. They're solvable. So renormalizable means that the the of interactions. There's something about interactions. Here, the interaction is zero. So these things, with the standard definition of renormalizability, these are renormalizable. They're free. They're free. And they're solvable, right? You just diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is great. And you can compute correlation functions because everything is Gaussian. But that doesn't fit the general framework. But the other examples are even richer. So it's the, the definition have to describe any lattice posing for that uh, linear behavior. So whatever theory that you build, they have to capture what's going on the any type of lattice. That, that would be nice. That would be nice. I'm, I'm in no position to bargain. I would take whatever is given. If somebody gives me a definition that covers some of the cases, that would be fine. Uh, the, the goal of this talk was to tell you the general dogma and yeah. Why the general dogma might not cover all cases? Or some of these lattices realize all the lab by some lab. Ah, that's a good question. So there is an ongoing effort to try and find some of these systems. And so far, this hasn't happened. And one reason for that is that they have huge technological implications. So finding this thing in the lab, no matter how complicated it is, will have huge technological implications. Like in what, in what sense? As I said before, for example, quantum memory. Because you can have a relatively small amount of material which has this large number of ground states 
pretty ground state, that would be a state that you keep in the memory. But then it is robust in the sense that you kick it, then it, it doesn't change. That, that's the requirement. Now, it could be asked what happens about finite temperature. There are lots of things to understand. But, and, and I should say, this was one of the original motivations to look for that. Now, personally, I know nothing about quantum memories. And for me, it's shocking that my prejudice about quantum field theory breaks down. And that's why I'd like to, to understand that. I think these models tell us that there's something very interesting going on, either within quantum field theory or slightly outside that framework, that we have not even started scratching the surface of. And that's why I think it's interesting. Are you suggesting you can realize these as materials? Yeah. You, you're saying it. I hope so. I, I don't I see why not. I think you might. You think you can realize I, these. I hope so. Yeah. Behaviors I don't see why not. I don't see why not. So for the Lipschitz theory, the, the, this has a long history of calling pneumatics. I think actually in your home institution was one of the first yeah. people who worked on it. It's not some physical for business. Yeah. It's totally legitimate. Yeah. Why not? Including the name Lipschitz theory was also called in your institution. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. At the time, I think it was the time I was there. So it was your institution. Yeah, we were colleagues, but not at the same time. I, I think your your lattice examples were all three-dimensional, right? Yeah. Are, are there any two-dimensional? Okay, examples? that's a good question. So there is a question of what you mean by what are the requirements you impose. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So well, local, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but what do you want? So the Actually, mathematicians and physicists, in phys different kinds of physicists, impose different requirements. So we can start with the topological field theory. Mathematicians and high energy physicists are perfectly happy with topological field theory in one dimension, maybe only time, or in one plus one dimensions. Condensed matter physicists exclude that because they add another requirement. This is as we talked before about the adjectives that you can put. They add another requirement that there's no local operator acting in the space of ground states. That's what they need for the system to be robust. Without requirement, topological field theory starts in two plus one dimensions. If you look at these systems and you use exactly this requirement that there is no there is a gap and there's no local operator acting in the space of ground states, then you can prove that this does not happen in two plus one. It starts at three plus one. But Can you repeat that statement. Sorry? Can you please repeat that statement? If you add another requirement that there is no local operator acting in the space of ground states, so every operator that acts in the space of ground state must involve a line, not a point. If you add this requirement, then this behavior in, with gap systems exists only in three plus one and, and up, not in two plus one. If you relax that requirement, then it's straightforward to find examples even in 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 1. The examples are more degenerate because we are in fewer dimensions, and they don't satisfy this extra requirement. But they are much more manageable because we are in fewer dimensions. You know, everything is simpler in the lower dimension. So you, I think you should study all of them. One more question. You said for condensed matter, condensed matter physicists, the lattice is physical and matters, right? So in these cases where things about the lattice can be determined from large scale behavior, I mean, like, that's good for them, right? I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm just interested in facts. <laughs> <laughs> but they can discern more facts. You, you can do experiments at large scale yeah. and then determine the lattice behavior. Or are, are they considered pathological because they're hard to approximate? Well, are you starting point the lattice or are you starting, or is, is your starting point the lattice or the continuum? Well, I thought the lattice is the physical thing. For, in condensed matter physics, they start with the lattice mm -hmm. and they want to determine the long distance behavior. Oh, you don't, you don't care so much about the small distance. You don't care so much about what the lattice does. You care a lot, but okay. you, vary, you vary what happens at short distances and you ask, how, what what does this imply at long distances? Okay. 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 I, I'm talking about uh, 
I mean, there, this is a very big field of that's not physics. Maybe 100,000 people worldwide. So and this description is kind of too, too inaccurate to describe all of them. But a large fraction of them, that's what they do. Okay. In one, in one way or another. Okay, I was thinking like if I were a condensed matter physicist, and I found out that, you know, the lattice underlying the material I'm studying uh, exhibited this exotic behavior, then I could say a lot about that, right? Because I can do some large scale experiment and then say a lot about at the lattice level. That, that's the case, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's right. So I'd I, I like to rephrase what you said because I think it's very important. Historically, in condensed matter physics, we start from the UV and we try to determine the IR. In particle physics, historically, we do experiments and we're trying to find what's the theory of Schroeder distances that gives rise to this behavior. So that's how the standard model was found. This is how the W and Z bosons were predicted. This is how the Higgs bosons was predicted. And people keep going to Schroeder distances and have ideas what would be there. And then there are experiments to check it. So we kind of do it in, in opposite directions, but I think it's too narrow to think of it as a one-way street that we only cross to the right and they only cross to the left. Because I think we should go back and forth because the, the two communities can teach each other. And this particular field, there's also many mathematicians that enter. So this is really an interface of three communities that talk together. I, tomorrow, I'm here in New York tomorrow. We have a meeting of a condensed matter group that the Simon's collaboration that I'm part of. I'm the high energy physicist, and most of them are condensed matter people. And there are some mathematicians also interested in these things. So I think it's good that people interact with different prejudices. OK, thank you. Well, let's um, let's uh, thank Nathan again.